Welcome to the Answer Podcast. I'm your host, Captain Manuel Calo, and today we have a distinguished guest, Lieutenant Marisa A. Lemar, an English instructor at the U.S. Naval Academy. Lieutenant Lemar has an extensive background in public affairs and media operations, having served in high-stakes roles such as during at the 58th Presidential Inauguration and Pacific Partnership 16. She also uh, a senior consultant with Deloitte, managing strategic public affairs programs. Before we, we begin, I'd like to remind our listeners that the views expressed here uh, are personal and do not necessarily reflect the uh, official policy or position of the U.S. Navy or any government organization. With uh, further ado, I present uh, Lieutenant Marisa Lemar. Welcome to the ANSA podcast. Thank you, Manuel. It's a pleasure. Yeah, so I appreciate it to be here. Um, I know we are kicking off um, this podcast on September, September 15th as the Hispanic Heritage Month, uh, which is going to be running from September 15th all the way to October 15th. So this is going to be our mark for the answer podcast with you um, on the Hispanic Heritage Month. So I appreciate it to be here today, tonight. Um, so... Uh, Marisa, so we were uh, speaking briefly before we actually started to record, and we want to know who is uh, Lieutenant Marisa Lemar and her journey throughout the Navy, so you can actually take you to your journey. Sure. Uh, so my path is a little, probably unusual. So I grew up in Northern Virginia, just up the street from Quantico, the daughter of uh, soldiers and ended up joining the Navy. Mm -hmm. So I'll share a little bit about that, <laughs> okay. that path. Um, I saw through my parents what service looked like. So they didn't do a lot of moving around or PCSing while I was young, but I got to see what their service meant once they, um, once my dad retired and my mom separated after 12 years of active duty. I got to see the college that it paid for for them, the government, the federal government jobs that they had access to based on that experience. And so I always knew in the back of my mind that service would be a great path for me. Mm -hmm. I came to it a little later. Um, I wasn't ready at 18 to commit uh, to applying for ROTC or an academy or anything like that, but um, it was always in the back of my mind. So I went on to get my undergraduate degree, went to grad school and studied public diplomacy and met a great friend who was actually a service warfare officer. She had just come off of active duty and she was a reservist. And so she showed me what that service looked like, how she was juggling, going to school, serving, and doing something she loved. And so I knew I wanted to serve, but I didn't want to serve for service's sake. I wanted to do something that I was passionate about, that I felt like I could succeed in. And so I wanted to find my niche professionally, and I found that through communications. Um, so I said, okay, communications, that's it's public affairs. Let's look at the services. Let's see. I'm a good fit, what opportunities there are, and um, no offense to our Army colleagues, but I felt like Navy Public Affairs kind of blew everyone away. I okay. uh, felt like the service was really proactive in terms of communicating with the public and all of our audiences, so I um, pursued a direct commission into the reserve component, which is a little unique because most people um, come into the reserve component from active duty or have prior experience, but um, I was able to get my commission from my civilian experience and my educational background. Yes. Um, so that was about 10 years ago now, and it's been um, a fun ride ever since. Yeah, so it is, it is, um, you mentioned that you're from the, you're, uh, you come from a military family, right? So that's basically, you know, the ins and outs Correct. of the military. Um, that's, that's, you're going to levitate mm -hmm. towards the, the military for a reason, right? Because like uh, you, you saw your, your, your dad, um, which is funny because um, like I, we were talking, I'm an army uh, officer and I'm working with the ANSA community and learning all the new terminology, <laughs> although it's similar. Uh, the other thing I, I got to my attention is that, okay, so you say the PAO program or the Public Affairs Office, uh, Office program from the Navy <laughs> is, is better than the Navy. Can you expand on, on that and, and why you mentioned that? Um, why I thought it was the best? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, sure. So I found that the Navy is eager to tell its story, even um, if things aren't going great. Mm -hmm. Like we're out there, we're very forward, we're very transparent, and I, I admire that. Um, I think it's it's it breeds a lot of trust with the American public, with taxpayers, and um, with our allies everywhere to see that we are engaging, not just when we need something, not just when things are going poorly, but just 
we're out there, we're in front of stories and we're, we're sharing the great things that our, our sailors are doing. And I liked that proactive approach rather than waiting for someone calling, someone knocking on your door saying, hey, what's going on here? What's the statement? What's, what's the word? We were just out, always out kind of in front of things. And I admired that. Yeah, and, and definitely like your degree, uh, you mentioned that um, you actually did the public diplomacy and writing, right? That's basically what you did. So mm -hmm. that actually helped you to navigate through the PAO and how you can tie your degree with the PAO. And then can you explain for the <laughs> audience, because like, we might ha have audience that doesn't know what public affair is and what they do. Um, can you actually explain that uh, as well for the listeners? Sure. So public affairs, we think of all, all the different audiences we're working to communicate with. It ranges from the parents, the spouses, the, the children of our service members to uh, Congress, to media representatives, to our allies, and, and even our adversaries. So just telling the story of our service um, in a responsible way, letting um, that narrative speak in terms of what where we're operating, what's going on, and, and how services kind of supporting our national and international aims. Mm -hmm. So really the, I think of it as the, the services storytellers, um, just keeping, keeping folks informed. Nice. And then how you can tie then your degree with the PAO, uh, the value that you can actually add on mm -hmm. to your, to your job. Sure. So I studied public diplomacy and I, I went that path. My undergrad degree is in political science. Mm -hmm. And so I went to public diplomacy thinking, okay, I really want to do international relations. Um, the focus within within political science for me was international relations. And so I was looking for a grad degree that did that. Um, and I went to University of Southern California and that program is housed in the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, but it's kind of dual, dual hatted in the sense that a lot of the classes you take are, are IR classes, international relations. And so I went into that thinking, okay, kind of cool that's in the communication school, but I want to do international stuff. And I was just kind of blown away with the communications coursework. And that whole program is based on individuals, citizens, um, civilians telling the story of nations. So you think of traditional diplomacy, it's ambassador to ambassador, it's government to government. Public diplomacy gives that power back to, to people, to groups of individuals that you don't traditionally think of as having that leverage. And so that, um, that educational background really exposed me to how important narratives are and the messages that we convey and how it doesn't just have to be the top leaders in power telling that story and engaging it they come at all levels and so i think that really prepared me to be a strong candidate for the public affairs program because i, I had an understanding of, of communication at kind of all levels of of government and citizenship okay and then what recommendation can you provide to anyone that's looking to actually pursue the pao um, either the Navy or any other military branch? Um, do lots of reading and writing um, <laughs> would be my biggest tip. Um, lots of reading makes you a better writer. And I think the, the best public affairs officers are those that, that can write clearly, that can write effectively. Um, just be a consumer of information. I always sure. say we have two ears, one mouth. Mm -hmm. We should be doing a lot of um, listening and a lot of just paying attention to what's going on to be more informed about um, our world. I think that makes a big difference. But honestly, the biggest things are brushing up on the on the um, the writing skills. Uh, the rest can kind of follow from that. But it's it's a good skill that anyone can practice. Anyone can get better at. Um, it's concrete, and there's lots of ways to do that. Yeah, in the army, we have officers, and then we have enlisted sort of personnel. Is the same setup for? I am assuming that this is the same setup mm -hmm. for for the navy. Exactly. Yeah. So we're um, we're supported with the mass communication specialists, our MCs. We call them. That's the the enlisted team that that makes all the magic happen. I like to say they have all the fun. So, so what's the big difference between an officer and an actually enlisted in the PAO role? I would say the big difference is. The enlisted teams are out there capturing video, capturing mm -hmm. photos, writing the stories, um, usually writing the, the social media posts and that, that kind of thing. And the, the PAOs instead are approving things that are going okay. out. Okay. They're um, providing the, the shot sheets saying, all right, we're gonna, you're going to go cover this event. Make sure you get photos of these, please. Make sure that we have images of this. Um, we're kind of the, the, the management of that. Um, 
for the more tactical that the, the MCs, the mass communication specialists are engaged with. And then definitely they, they can they can cover any exercise operations, anything you can get <clears throat> um, driven to. Um, and then oh, the way we see it is, okay, you have the MCs, they go and cover the, the stories mm -hmm. and then they have to have filters, right? So before we publish anything, um, so that's how you come in action. It's like, hey, before we publish anything, we have to feel, make sure that everything is correct, um, mm -hmm. et cetera. So that's how, the way you support Exactly. Exactly. Just make sure there's no no glaring like, security things, OPSEC, um, things that we don't want kind of splashed on the front page if it's not a, an accurate representation, just that kind of thing. Um, making sure we're we're portraying things clearly, accurately, and and responsibly. It's just kind of that last that last check that we're providing as the release authority, essentially. Yeah, and and I have to ask obviously because social media is a big big in in nowadays, right? So that we, everything mm -hmm. drives through the social media, and I don't know as a PAO, you might know this Facebook pages like Army WTF. Um, so mm -hmm. how you actually react when something gets to those, to that level, if you can share anything like, um, either positive or negative, because not, nothing, not everything that goes through that is negative. So they, they go some positive right. as well. Yeah. So I can only speak to my experience. I actually mm -hmm. haven't been in a position where I've been at a command that has kind of been spotlighted in one spotlighted. of those kind of, um, in those kinds of accounts. But I can say just from my personal perspective, I see value in that because it's kind of the ear to the ground of what like the troops in your case, what the fleet, what they're experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's valuable for leadership to kind of have that understanding um, at that level. Yeah. And so like you mentioned, like some of it, it positive can come of it too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've, I've seen, I've seen that as well, but I think it's, it should be understood kind of like as another source of information. Um, yeah. A way that people can kind of share how they're feeling, what's going on, in a in a in a a little bit more of an anonymized way. But I don't mm -hmm. think it necessarily discredits the information. Yeah, uh, it's like a, I mean, it's a way to provide check and balances. That's that's mm -hmm. how, that's what one way I can see it. Um, some leaders don't like the way it is, but like you said, I mean, sometimes like the the soldiers and the seamen and, and the airmen they, they relate to, and then that's the way they communicate when sub, something's not going the way they think they're, they're supposed to be going. But yeah, but PIO okay. is make, making sure that, hey, your boss, and okay, you're gonna have a boss as well, that, hey, sir, we're mm -hmm. gonna make sure you're square away um, and before we post anything in our social official, uh, official social media, make sure like everything mm -hmm. is good to go before we actually go ahead and release, right? Exactly. And it's consistent with what we've been saying before mm -hmm. and, and all of our other kind of messages and our other mediums of expressing ourselves. Yeah, and then, and then um, it is, how is like, a, is it like a packet that if somebody in the Navy can actually want to apply for to be in an APAO? Like um, anyone can apply from, from, from the get-go? Like I say, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a civilian, I want to be a PAO or it has to be a, some sometime in the Navy and they, they can apply, how that works? Good question. It it was more so in the past that um, folks would come in, join a restricted line or an unrestricted line community. So that's if you think of your your ship drivers, your pilots, your um, submariners. That that would be your path, and then you would do a lateral transfer over to the public affairs community after after some time. Um, but now more so, there there is the opportunity to apply as a civilian for OCS for Officer Candidate School and have that path to public affairs. I'm not super well informed into how the numbers for that, but I know that's a path so people can come based on their civilian experience and apply for the commission and in that same breath apply um, okay. to be considered for the community right out of the gate. Okay, that's that's great to know um, that this has mm -hmm. been offered because uh, I'll give you an example. I didn't know that in the Army, uh, the contracting officer... Uh, the the one that they manage contracts here in the army they're offering right now the direct commissions that I didn't I have no idea that they're offering to the civilians say hey if you have bass experience on contracting you can apply for direct mm -hmm. commission and then we can take you and I was, it looks like it might have a the same thing with the PAO as well right mm -hmm. and that was my path on the reserve side it was the essentially reserve. the same thing coming in totally green as a civilian and um, just okay. based on the background. 
based on your background, then that's how you apply for the commission and that uh, you guys select it. Exactly. That's, that's, that's great to hear that it works to you. Now you're a lieutenant, mm -hmm. right? Um, <laughs> so, and then can you, uh, and we, we talk about multiple, I mean, the PAO covered like exercises and my, my introduction, I said that you actually has, has gone and covered, you know, different, you know, operations. Um, can you walk through the, like experience supporting the Pacific Pat uh, Partnership 16 or and uh, exercise Ochi Freedom Guardian 17. I know the Ochi mm -hmm. Freedom, I've been there and I think it's in Korea, on Bright Run, right? It is. It yeah. is in Korea, yeah. I went in 2016 uh, to, to actually as a support role. Uh, can you actually walk that experience for the audience? Yeah, to, uh, we, we just missed each other then. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of, I'll, I'll, I'll do that one first since we were talking about mm -hmm. that. So yeah. um, I had the opportunity to actually fly out to Busan, South Korea. So mm -hmm. just like the, the southern part of the peninsula on the water and support that exercise with our, our ROK, our Republic of Korea colleagues. And that was really neat because we were working, you know, we had the 12 hour shifts, we're working this scenario, but it was cool because we we're working literally side by side with our okay colleagues and not just the Republic of Korea um, sailors, officers, but actual public affairs officers. Mm -hmm. So that was really cool because I got to understand the nuances of how they communicate with their public, how they describe North Korea, how they message um, aggressive actions and how that's, that's different from us, right? They're not our neighbors. They don't have the same history. Um, little nuances like if they abbreviate North Korea, it's a lowercase n and a big K mm -hmm. because the North is um, inconsequential to the big, the, the Korea part, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that was a really valuable experience. I had the opportunity to kind of work through a problem set and understand their, their preferences. And I feel um, really close to understanding a little better what's going on in that part of the world from those those brief weeks that I spent there. Um, and it was it's neat because I told that story to one of my students now, because I teach at the Naval Academy and he's um, one of our international students from South Korea. Mm -hmm. And he'll like now always bring me things that um, the ROK Navy is is posting on their Instagrams and things like that. So it's it's been an experience that has stayed with me. Um, I was able to, you know, spend time with the our counterparts, like going to the galley with them, um, eating with them. And I just shared a little bit about my background and how I love to write. And I remember on the last day, um, my colleague brought me this like beautiful pen set because he remembered that I like to write. Mm -hmm. And just those kinds of partnerships, even at the personal level, um, mean so much when you look at kind of our geopolitical environment. And at the end of the day, it's mm -hmm. it's humans working together. Um, so that was a pretty cool experience. Like I, I couldn't tell you what, what we did day in and day out. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a bunch of meetings and it was long, long shifts. But the, um, the coordination and cooperation between um, our nations, even just like within our little public affairs team, exactly, mm -hmm. was was huge. And so that was a lot of fun. Yeah, so that goes back to the OE variables. So in the military, we mm -hmm. have the operational environment variables, and the first one is the political uh, uh, environment. So we, when we do operations in the military, we have to understand the OE variables, and we have to understand the political contract. And you mentioned mm -hmm. That there's nuances between South Korea and North Korea, how they actually uh, write their North Korea and, and why they do that. And then going to that type of scenario, you have to understand um, what's, what's happening um, so you can actually do the best you can. Uh, the thing is, like, I remember the propaganda that I was going through. Mm -hmm. Um, from both sides, um, back in the in the border between North Korea and South Korea, they they were throwing flyers from one side to another, mm -hmm. you know, like doing propaganda. Uh, I don't know if you experienced that when you went, but I did experience that when I was like doing my exercise. Well, that was what was so kind of interesting. So I mentioned like we were stationed in in Busan, which is the southern mm -hmm. part, and southern. we had a weekend free, right? And so I took the train up mm -hmm. to Seoul. Um, and I was able to, to hop on a kind of a last minute DMZ tour. Um, and this was at the time that there were a lot of missiles being launched this, this time of year. It was 2017 and it was just like almost every day and it was happening while I was there. Mm -hmm. And it was really fascinating to see like, this is what they deal with regularly. And this is kind of the problem scenario that we're, we're walking through. And, um, you know, I'm getting the alerts on my phone. I'm going mm -hmm. for a run. This is happening like not across the world, but 
here, here. Um, <laughs> yeah. right, right in our backyard. And so it was just, it was, it was a, a really eye-opening experience just for the reasons you're talking about mm-hmm. um, and it's kind of seeing it history playing out in real time yep. um, when you make that trek. No, most definitely. Uh, when I was in, in, in the exercise, I think we had to go in lockdown because it was threat, mm-hmm. like real threats happening between, right. you know, from north to south. Uh, and we were like, okay, what's happening? We we're supposed to be in doing an exercise and we actually going, seems like, but it was more like going back to the propaganda more than anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's important to actually understand the political construct when you go to an operations. And PAO is part of it because you're writing a story. You, you actually are trying to write a story or you're helping to mm-hmm. write that story um now what about the when you uh serve as a media operation officer during the 58 presidential inauguration how that experience was for you that one was pretty unique so mm-hmm. as you can imagine that was um 2017 mm-hmm. uh all eyes were kind of on that inauguration we i spun up for that i think it was october so the October before, so I, I signed up. We didn't know how things were going to go, who was going to win. We were just signing up to, to tell the story of what the military support of the inauguration looks mm-hmm. like. And so for us, the big events were the, the inaugural parade and the balls. And so we're kind of telling the story of the ceremonial aspect of that peaceful transfer of power. Um, and so for me, I had the opportunity to kind of do the media outreach and get our, it was a joint team, so get our sailors, airmen, Marines, soldiers spotlighted because they came from all over the world, all over the country to be a part of this team. Mm-hmm. So it was it was cool. I mean, everything from taking them to a Baltimore Ravens game and having them do the salute to service and kind of show that um, these are the kind of folks that are are part of our history, right, as we, we welcome a new president in um, that ceremonial way. And it was pretty eye-opening to see how quickly information vacuums get filled. Mm-hmm. So I was working on inauguration day, I was at the Pentagon, and that's the staging area for the parade, mm-hmm. where, it, where it steps off, where all the service members um, begin as they, they make their way through downtown. And so I spent my whole time there. We It was actually a pretty light media day. We just had Good Morning America for the duration, and they were kind of telling the story of, of service members taking off and, and having this long day before the balls in the evening. And so that was my morning. And then I went into one of the inaugural balls in the evening and in that time between i actually got a call from harvey levin with tmz asking me about something that had happened at the capitol mm-hmm. during this the swearing in ceremony and i'm i'm just completely um in the dark because again i had been at the pentagon all day managing our own media going on there i had no idea what he was referring to and spent a good probably like two hours going back and forth with him on the phone and it really showed me the importance of kind of stamping out rumor um not letting lack of information be its own story mm-hmm. because at the end of the day i couldn't even tell you what it was but it was a big nothing burger mm-hmm. um it was like they wanted a story to be there there wasn't um but just because of my role i was i was somehow the number that he got um and just having that big responsibility and just that reminder that everyone is watching this was was a pretty incredible experience no, and, and, and what get to my attention, like you said, the rumor spreads like like wildfire mm-hmm. in, in California, right? So it, it goes yeah. wild once they start like uh, putting posting this on social media nowadays. Mm-hmm. We can see a real life right now. Like we are seeing this like time now. Uh, every day we can see like how the, all this uh, new outlets uh, get spreading. And then sometimes you have to do fact checkings, right? Because uh, you don't know whether mm-hmm. it's true or not before you actually continue, you know, um, sharing something, right? Right. And that's what's the saying, like a, a lie or a rumor gets halfway around the world while the truth is still tying its shoes. Um, and so our, our kind of big tenet as public affairs is, maximum disclosure minimum delay but it's a it's a tricky thing to accomplish sometimes because again you want to fill that space and make sure that you don't let the the rumors or the or the misinformation creep in mm-hmm. but you also want to make sure that you're speaking with as much information and as much detail as is possible at that time so it's a it's a balancing act for sure no most definitely and then this leads me to my next question and and it goes tied to what we're talking right now is how do you approach how do you approach the responsibility of overseeing public affairs programs both in the navy and deloitte 
and then how how you manage and leverage different communication tools and technologies as well. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, yeah, because as a reservist, I'm kind of dual hatted in that, and a lot of the approach and skills I like to think are transferable. But it kind of goes back to what I had said pretty early on with this idea of, of listening more than anything and, and kind of trusting those instincts. And while I may apply public affairs to different um, industries, I've done everything from healthcare to IT to research and development. Um, at the end of the day, it's still based on building trust and telling a story clearly, concisely, having buy-in in that sense and, and building that, um, again, that trust with those who follow us and those who have entrusted us with their their loved ones. Um, so it kind of comes back to building that skill set, um, building from that foundation, I think, and really being able to know if you're listening first, you're understanding what people's understanding is, you're understanding what their preferences, their priorities, what their concerns are, and that makes you all the more better suited to respond and to, to kind of be a trusted information partner if that's what you're starting from. And I leverage that for Deloitte too, because mm -hmm. as a consultant, um, sure, I'm a communications consultant. So at the end of the day, I'm sitting there working um, communications products and strategic planning for that. Mm -hmm. But before that, I'm, I'm a consultant. So I'm there to hear the problem. I'm there to advise. I'm there to then kind of see it through. Um, but it's a similar approach where first I need to know what the pain point is. I need to know what we're, we're struggling through, what we're trying to achieve or what we're trying to um, rectify. And from then you can kind of use the tool toolbox of um, if it's writing something, if it's getting someone in front of the camera, if it's um, kind of a series of photos, whatever the, the kind of best solution is based on the situation at hand, but kind of trusting in the, again, toolbox that has been built from experience. Yeah, no, most definitely. And then can you point like a, a most rewarding moments in the military media engagement? Any Anything that you want to point for you? Uh, easily, mm -hmm. easily. So I've had the honor of supporting the Department of Defense Warrior Games mm -hmm. and then the Invictus Games for, gosh, probably like five times now. And that started, that was one of the first public affairs things I did. Back in 2015, the games were hosted in Quantico. The Marines hosted it. And um, these these sporting events, it's basically the DOD's version of the Paralympics. Mm -hmm. So adaptive sports for our wounded, ill, and injured service members and also veterans. And that has hands down been the most rewarding um, opportunity that I've had as a public affairs officer and telling that story to, to the public about how these um, individuals have sought to conti either continue serving, right? Because it's wounded, ill, and injured service members or continue serving in a new way as part of um, their services team on a different level um, through adaptive sports. And seeing um, one of our, like our, a bunch of, actually a bunch of our female athletes uh, featured in Vogue, for example, wow. getting, to take, getting to take a group of athletes mm -hmm. to um, Connecticut to go to ESPN for a, for a day of like media roundtables, just to show that story to the American public that, um, Service comes with risks, mm -hmm. right? There, there are young men and women every day putting life, limb, and mm -hmm. everything on the line. And just because there's injuries, you know, some invisible, doesn't mean that they stop yeah. serving. And so being able to spotlight kind of their strength through that has been one of the biggest honors I've had. No, it's, it's most definitely, uh, I, I can actually tell the, your passion to, to whatever you cover in that story. And, mm -hmm. and yes, we have to appreciate our, our veterans. And you, you mentioned that sometimes we can see the wounds, sometimes we cannot mm -hmm. see the wounds. Um, and then we are battling, battling our own battles, right? Sometimes, uh, most of the time. Right. And seeing them like actually on action, um, like the version of the Paralympics, I think it was mm -hmm. a great, great experience. Uh, I, I, it's glad to hear and, and you sharing with us uh, in the answer podcast. Yeah. Super inspiring. Mm -hmm. It's just, yeah, the, the, to see the pride um, of their loved ones too, when they see the, the like training come together and all the, the long days and, and the months of preparation um, to be able to put on a gold medal, uh, shake, shake Prince Harry's tan. Cause it's, you know, kind of his baby too with the Invictus game. So it's, 
pretty powerful experience. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, so let's switch. So we have talked that you actually, uh, is, you are a consultant in Deloitte and then you actually mm -hmm. a PAO in the Navy and then they correlate because like they go hand in hand. Um, uh, mm -hmm. now what drew you to actually teach you, uh, teaching you English at the U S Naval Academy? Yeah, it's funny. If I look back on my career and my education, it was always kind of written in the stars. So I studied political science, but so many of my electives that I took were education classes. Um, and so I also, while I was at Brown, I, I volunteered and I taught English to um, adult learners, uh, many of them Spanish speakers, but I just had that informal experience went on to grad school and I was a TA, I was a teaching assistant. I, I just kind of wanted to be in the classroom supporting learning of others. Uh, my first gig after grad school was being a, a writing coach for other master's students where I was advising on on their, um, their written materials. And so I kind of always loved that feeling of being in the classroom and helping others. Mm -hmm. Um, didn't know the path to it and, and kind of kind of like my path to service. It was just like always in the back of my mind, if there's a right opportunity, I'll jump at it. Um, and the right opportunity was the reserve recall opportunity. So the Naval Academy at any given point has 30 reservists on, on campus, on the yard that are teaching. And so every year they bring in 10 of us um, to serve three-year orders. And when I saw that they were looking for, for applicants um, kind of at, at my rank and around my rank who had master's degrees that were relevant, I thought I need to put my hat in the ring. Um, I've got this master's, I've, I've won a master's in writing. I was like, that, that has to be a good fit for teaching English. I have to try based on being a public affairs officer and, and having this degree, I have to put my name in and was just so happy that I did because it's been just a really great opportunity to be able to be a part of helping the next generation of our, our services, um, our sea service leaders, right. in the Naval and the Navy and Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then. Definitely, most definitely. Um, I'm an English adult learner uh, myself. I mm -hmm. went to I went to actually DLI, the um, Defense Language Inst Inst Institute, mm -hmm. back in when I was 27 years old, because um, mm -hmm. I grew up in Puerto Rico, uh, Spanish speaker, and then joining the army, but I had to switch uh, languages from from Spanish to English, and I keep mm -hmm. today's day I'm, I'm still learning. Um, but it's great to hear it. Um, and I had a great experiences with my teachers in, in English. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit more challenging, but it, it's doable. And um, I yeah. think in your role, you can actually blend your PAO experience with your writing, with your background, with Deloitte, and then helping others to actually uh, be proficient at the English um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, language. Right. And so it's one of the sections I taught this past academic year was a whole section of international students. Mm -hmm. um, so 15 midshipmen who came from all over the world to study here in Annapolis. Um, and same thing, like they all different levels of English proficiency. But the fact that they're sitting in college classrooms, reading novels with me and writing essays, I can't even begin to imagine um, how they do it. But it's just been pretty inspiring. But just as you describe, it's tough. It's <laughs> tough, and to just play some small role in that is is pretty cool. No, it's it's, it's tough. I can't I can't speak by experience because I know I've been there <laughs> in those shoes. I've been a student before um, as a <laughs> learning the English uh, myself. Um, but yeah, uh, now so so what is next for you? Like in in the military and civilian career, what, what, what's next for Lieutenant Marisa de Mar? Sure. So I will promote at some point in fiscal year 25, uh, yeah, 2025 to Lieutenant Commander. So I was selected for that promotion. So whatever Congrats. that leadership looks like, thank you. Um, kind of seeing that through, seeing what opportunities there are to, to lead at the next level. So I don't know specifically um, what unit, what, what that looks like for me, but really excited for the next level of responsibility that the Navy's entrusting me with. Mm -hmm. Um, the civilian side's a little easier to answer because I'll actually be starting a doctorate in January, um, studying education um, with the University of Miami, doing an online program. So that'll that'll be keeping me busy as I as I wrap up my my time at the Naval Academy, and um, just kind of turning back to to my time at Deloitte, joining the firm again with 
as you mentioned, I mean, there's so much that is complimentary about my experience, certainly as a PIO, but even teaching that I'm going to bring back to them. Um, so excited, hopefully for the next level of responsibility there as well in my civilian, civilian role. Most definitely. And then let's, let's talk about answer. Can you, can you speak about mm -hmm. your answer experience to the audience? Yeah. So I, I, pretty soon after I commissioned, I, I learned about ANSO through a close, close public affairs friend of mine. She's, um, was very active in it. And ANSO and the Latina style symposium were the reason that she applied for her commission. Um, and so she told me about it and I, I reached out, um, to, to the leadership team and I joined and I saw what was going on. I was in the DC area. So there was, there were a lot of events that I could kind of, um, learn about, but I actually took the opportunity and I joined the board of directors and I serve as the national PAO for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a really cool responsibility at, at a, a really junior rank to be able to put together things like brochures and help put flyers together for the symposiums and really kind of make the case for what um, the organization does and that it's, it's welcoming, you know, it's not just officers, it's um, all the sea services and now beyond, which I yeah. think is a really powerful thing to share. Mm -hmm. um, but really this, this affinity group that is there for the support of everyone who, who wants to, you know, have this value of networking and mentorship that is offered. So it was kind of my opportunity to help tell that, um, that story. Yeah. So like I said, it's extending now uh, the answer. I mean, there's, few other you know branches that are joining now the answer i'm one of them there's more army mm -hmm. that have joined the answer community and air force as well um it is it's getting expanded because i uh, lieutenant colonel montal Benz, which is the current president today's day vision is to actually keep expanding the answer experience to other service branches such as army and, mm -hmm. and air force not only the sea services um right. but it's a great experience um we just had the symposium um, not too long ago, a couple of months ago, and it turned mm -hmm. super, super well. Um, great mentorship for junior enlisted personnel and, and company grade officers, et cetera. So mm -hmm. it, it was great. Um, now they're, they're actually planning the next symposium, which is in December, uh, the West Region Symposium. Um, so we will like to, to people that are listening to this to, to take a look at the ANSA community. So you can go, you can go to www.ansamil.org. And if you're in the uh, West Side area, I mean, in California, this time it's going to be in San Diego. It is San Diego, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so it's going to be um, a great mentorship section for mm -hmm. whoever wants to actually get that. And you can, you can, and we're going to be closing out a little bit. Um, what's the importance of mentorship in the actual, on the military service? And I, it's just a question I'm, I'm just asking you. I, mentorship is how you, I think, learn what you're capable of. Mm -hmm. um, it pushes you to kind of think through the next step personally, professionally, whatever, whatever that type of mentorship relationship is. But I think a good mentorship relationship is saying, Hey, check this out. I think you'd be a good fit for this. Um, this is what you do to be competitive for, for that thing that you're interested in. And it's, it's honestly, I think the, the key for so much of the success that you see, I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a senior leader who could not point to the mentorship or the mentors who helped get them there. Um, in terms of supporting them and providing, even if it's just information, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And that can include valuable opportunities, not just the opportunities themselves, but maybe the opportunities that make you a good candidate for something. And so I think mentorship is so key to just talk to someone who's been there before, mm -hmm. uh, someone who kind of knows the ins and outs, knows the, the roadblocks you may encounter and how to get, how to get through them. I think what's not talked about enough is also peer mentorship, that there can be someone who's, who's right there next to you at your rank at your same level who can offer that same expertise mm -hmm. based on what they've seen. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that's another, another key piece, but I don't think anyone gets very far on their own without kind of leaning on those relationships and those trusted bonds. Yeah, most definitely. And in, in not only in the military, I think as overall, like any, like I'm, I imagine in Deloitte, mm -hmm. you have your mentors because like there's people that are being in front of you. They're like have 
long mm -hmm. time in, in, in the company, you'll absorb whatever you can take from that mentorship and then apply it to yourself. Um, and yeah, but it's a great, and it also it's a great tool for those who are listening that, that provide that mentorship that people are looking um, in this, specifically mm -hmm. in the military sections, um, branches. Now, are there any upcoming projects or deployment that you are excited about that you want to share with us? Anything special? Um, nothing specific at this point because I'm still on this the same tour, which is exciting in its own right. Mm -hmm. um, but that just means that I don't have, uh, since I'm not a reservist, I'm not doing that kind of unit work. I don't have an annual training or an exercise right. or something specific on the horizon. So it's really just kind of the excitement of the day in and day out right. here at the Academy. Yeah. Um, well, any, any, you know, so, um, advice to those that are trying to actually that you would like to give to those listeners that want to join any service like any military branch what piece of advice you can give to them uh biggest advice would be to ask a lot of questions even the ones you think are silly even the ones you make you a little nervous because you're your own best advocate um it's it's a big decision so you need to be as informed as possible um, get a lot of people in your corner to bounce those ideas off of. Don't try and do something like this in a vacuum. Um, the more people who know your interests, the more people who can advocate for you, um, but also kind of give you a reality check if maybe um, a different path is is a better fit or, you know, maybe you should be aware of kind of a different opportunity. So I think leaning on a network and I, it's like a lowercase n network. I don't mean in, in any formal sense, but just like your people. Um, the people you trust, whether it's a teacher, whether it's a, a family member, just a close friend, or even a work colleague who, who has a similar path, I think um, bouncing ideas off of them and bouncing your intentions off of them um, goes a long way. Because again, it's not a decision that should be taken lightly, mm -hmm. um, but just being as informed as possible, I think makes all the difference in the world and doing your homework. So when you're having those conversations with the people who make the decisions, um, if it's a board you're applying for, or an interview that you have to do to get that commission or get um, that opportunity that you have done the work to be informed and um, kind of show your passion in that way. So those would be the biggest um, keys that I'd recommend. Thank you, Marisa. So we're approaching to the end of the podcast. I do appreciate that your time. Uh, it was great to hear uh, PAO uh, honored because I am, I'm on, in the board of the member, uh, BO, BOD of the mm -hmm. actual board members of the ANSO committee as the PO assistant. I'm, I'm helping with the, with the YouTube and I know you were former from ANSO. Um, it's a great that I have this conversation with you and coming from a PAO, right? And the light and any, cl uh, closing comments before we actually, uh, finish our conversation. And now just to thank you for the opportunity. I hope that people, stay informed and, and follow along. I've enjoyed watching these. It sounds funny to say watching these podcasts, but I, I really do. I actually watch the videos. I think it's, it's valuable. I, people, it's it kind of sounds silly to say, but people like talking about themselves, mm -hmm. but there's so much we learn from each other's stories mm -hmm. and the similarities we can see. And, um, you know, I like that you were asking about the advice I have because so many people have been so generous with me mm -hmm. of their experience and their knowledge and their recommendations that, um, I think any little bit bit helps so you can kind of carve that out and, and find your people and, and find a niche in that way. Um, so that would be kind of be my only final encouragement there. Yeah, more, and I concur with everything you said. This is a type of mentorship, what we're doing right now. Um, it's not only talking about ourselves. I believe that we all have a story to share. And when I started this type of podcast in my own channel, which is a uh, side to the answer, I wanted to highlight service mm -hmm. members, what they do, and thank them for the actual service. Um, because we uh, we don't take lightly when you go out to the store and say, like, hey, thank you for your service. I mean, yeah, thank mm -hmm. you for your service. Because like um, we are like 1% of the population doing this, whether you're in the mm -hmm. reserves or you're like in the active duty. Yeah, I mean, we are doing this. So, Marisa, thank you. Appreciate it to being here tonight with us on the Answer Podcast. And then I'm going to be closing uh, now. So, thank you, Anuel. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, that's super. Uh, so that wraps, wraps up another episode of the Answer Podcast. A big thank you again to Lieutenant Marisa Lemar for joining us today and sharing her incredible journey and insights. Don't forget to subscribe to, to stay up to date and all future episodes 
uh, for the Answer Podcast. And feel free to leave us your thoughts and suggestions for future guests. Until te- uh, next time, I'm Captain Manuel Carlos signing off.